So today we are talking about internal memory. Uh, this means that we are going to be kind of storing information uh, from one cycle in the self-time circuit to another. And this can be through multiple cycles or just a single cycle. We can store any amount of data. Of course, the overhead grows as you would expect. Um, so we, we tend to try to keep it uh, limited to of either one bit or maybe like a one of three. Uh, but let's jump in. So you, when you store data, you, you use what you'd expect. You use an, an, an NLATCH. And kind of what's special about an NLATCH is that it already has a delay and sensitive encoding implemented. Uh, it is valid when either V0 when V0 disagrees with V1, right? So V0 is zero and V1 is one, or when V1 is zero and V0 is one. Uh, and it is neutral uh, when both V0 and V1 are one, are true. And so it's kind of inverted from your normal uh, one of two encoding, uh, which has a neutral state at zero, zero. You can make a latch that has a neutral state at zero, zero, and you can integrate that into the handshake uh, just as you would integrate uh, this kind of latch. In fact, um, any, there are any number of latches and C elements that you can use in your internal memory, uh, some more difficult than others. Uh, we'll, we'll just be starting with an latch for this one. And so our latch has two inputs. Um, underscore w0 and underscore w1. And so these write a value to the nlatch when they go low, not when they go high. So if underscore w0 goes low, it will write um, v0, setting it high and setting v1 low. So if we look at kind of our initial state down here at the bottom, we have, we've set our two write rails uh, to be uh, one and one, representing that they, you know, a write is not taking place. It is uh, currently holding state. We have set the uh, output values for V0 low and V1 high. Now, this V0, V1 uh, can be mapped to uh, zero and one, however you'd like. Um, it's kind of up to you. So, uh, V0 being zero and V1 being one could represent true or it could represent false. Uh, and that's entirely dependent on whether you want a fully inverted one of two encoding or just inverting the neutral state. So if we lower our right rail for W0, uh, then the first thing that will happen is v0 goes high so we enter our neutral state then v v1 goes low bringing us back into a valid state and it will be the opposite valid state than the one we were in so lowering w0 will always bring us to the same valid state with v0 being one and v1 being low then we can raise underscore w0 and the latch doesn't acknowledge that transition. So any, uh, any way that you end up integrating this latch into a, into a handshake, there will be an isochronic fork on underscore W0, which means that you're going to need to check the reset um, in your handshake separately. So we can then write the other value. If we lower underscore W1, then the first thing that happens is V1 goes high and that forces V0 low. And so we've just transitioned through our neutral state back into our other valid state. And then we can raise underscore W1. So we've got our latch and we need to now integrate this into a handshake. And the first thing, the first Kind of operation we want to perform on this latch is writing its value. So if we were to take this latch and stick it into the middle of a handshake, um, all of this 
uh, code in red is a standard WCHB, but it doesn't emit anything. It doesn't have an output channel. All right, so W0 and W1 are internal. It doesn't send an output request of any kind. Right now, the latch is not tied to this handshake. So this handshake operates independent of the latch. Uh, it's also a stable handshake by itself. W0 and W1 um, are checked that, that those rails are checked for val validity uh, by the downgoing rule on LE and the upgoing rule. Uh, on LE checks neutrality. And so this is currently, the, the production rules in red currently implement a sync, uh, a one bit sync. And it has a, a few extra inverters than you would actually need for a one bit sync, but that's just to make our uh, integration of this and latch easier. And so beyond this handshake, in order to make sure that the uh, mlatch and that you wait for the mlatch to transition through, uh, you know, from the set phase to the reset phase, you just have to wait for the associated valid state um, on the reset phase, right? So remember when we lowered one of the input rails, uh, the first thing that would happen is the associated uh, V would go high, and then after that, the opposite would go low. And so we're just waiting for that opposite to be low, signaling that we're in the other valid state. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So that's how you write an internal memory. If you want to read an internal memory, then it's quite a bit simpler. You have your uh, one of two encoding. It's inverted from your normal one of, of two encoding. And so you just use it as you would expect. So you have, if you have an output channel R and it has an enable RE, that RE signals when you want to read the value on the input latch. And so when RE is high, you grab the value from the input latch and you send it out on the output data for R. Uh, when RE is low, you just reset the output data for R and move on with your life. And so these two uh, operators are currently kind of independent from each other, right? The, the, the write and the read. And so you need to make sure that when you stick them together into a process, that you synchronize them properly. And so we're gonna use the same method to synchronize these that we used for conditional logic. Basically, we're gonna have a, uh, a bit of data, you know, a bit of uh, self-time delay and sensitive encoding to tell us when to do the write or when to do the read. Now, for this example, rather than using a separate uh, condition channel, we've integrated that choice into our input um, on the left-hand side. And so if we look at this CHP, we first read from L. If L, so L has three rails, a rail that tells us to do the read, and then a rail that tells us to write zero to the internal uh, memory, and a rail that, that tells us to write one to the internal memory. And so if the read rail is high, we read the value from B. If one of the two write rails are high, then we write the associated value to B. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're gonna start with the logic that we implemented for our write operator. Uh, this, is, this includes the weights on V uh, down here in the reset rules. And then we're going to rename a few things, right? So instead of L.F and L.P, we're gonna call it uh, write zero and write one. Then we're going to uh, kind of pull these uh, 
internal nodes together. So we're just going to make a little space here. It's ultimately the same C element. Um, there's no difference between this and this. So now we have some space to insert our read rules. So let's do that. Here's RE. Uh, when RE goes high, we read from the internal memory. When RE is low, we reset. But we need to uh, condition this read and make it wait for permission from uh, our channel L. And so we add a wait on L.R for that on our forward requests. And then we also use our forward requests on R to acknowledge that um, read command. On the reset phase, we also have to wait for uh, L.R to reset. And we also have to use, you know, wait for our output request rails uh, to be in a neutral state before resetting L.E. And that synchronizes the two operators, the write and the read. And so now we've got um, now we've got a process with an internal memory, and we can choose in one cycle to write it or in another cycle to read it. Now. Next lecture, we'll be covering how to both read and write the internal memory in a single cycle. Uh, it requires some, some extra considerations around protecting the forward drivers from instability. But for now, we're just going to leave these two mutually exclusive. The other thing that you'll note is that uh, we have to reset all of our state holding elements. So this is our C elements, and this is also our latches. So our internal memories have to be explicitly reset to a value. Otherwise, they'll boot up as X, and we won't know whether, you know, whether they're in uh, one valid state or the other. Now, realistically, they will boot up into a valid state, but it's also possible that they could boot up into a metastable state and take longer to enter that valid state than we expect. So we, we want to make sure to reset our end latch. So to do that, there are two ways that we can reset it. We can either re reset V0 high or we can reset V1 high. Um, it depends on kind of what you're trying to implement, what you choose to do. Uh, to reset v0 high, you use underscore reset in the v0 rule and s reset in the v1 rule. If you have information about how w, how these expressions in w are reset, then it can kind of optimize some of these reset rules away. So be aware of the states of your reset ex of your uh, kind of write expressions here uh, during reset because it can help you. I guess that also implies that these uh, expressions here don't have to be just a single variable. They can be any expression um, as long as that expression uh, is separable in the reset phase. I.e., you can look for a particular valid state of this internal memory in the reset rules for the forward drivers in order to acknowledge that transition. To reset V1 high, you would switch these. So you, you'd use underscore S reset for V1 and S reset for V0. So it's a, it's a symmetric uh, reset. Um, approach. So that covers the content for this lecture. Are there any questions before we jump into the examples? Okay. So for our examples, we have just one. It's uh, the one bit register that I showed you. Uh, we've added some uh, we're adding a method of verification to this example. And so we've got our normal e1.act. 
It has our register specification with an E1 of three for the left channel and an E1 of two for the right. And our goal is to implement this WCHV register from L to R. We've got a sync on R, but notice that we do not have a source. And so if we check, you know, we're, we're instantiating the sync, we're not instantiating a source, so we're leaving L dangling. So if we check E1.RC, you'll find that we have told the simulator about L and R, about these two channels. And so we tell it we have a one of N encoding on L here. We tell it that that one of N encoding is a request uh, for the channel L with an acknowledge or with an enable E. And then we tell it to pull, to inject values into that channel from this file, E1 underscore L dot dat. And to do so, over and over and over again, so in a loop. We're also telling it that we have a one of two encoding on R, on the request rails, that that one of two encoding belongs to the channel R with an enable E, and to double check any values that it receives from R against this expect file, E1 underscore R dot dat, and to do so in a loop. And so using these inject and expect files, we can verify that the values that are written uh, and the values that are read match up against each other. Uh, so this is a, a, like a functional correctness check. And so if we check E1 underscore L dot that, we'll see that we just have a list of uh, values two, zero, two, one, two, zero, right? Uh, and two represents read, zero represents write a zero, one represents write a one. If we look at E1 underscore R dot that, we see that we have uh, values that are read, so zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. And also we've added uh, a, a new RC file. So we have e1.rc and e1.rc has fully random timing with cycles between the reset phases. And e1zice.rc has limited random timing, bounded random timing with advanced 40 between the reset phases. And so, you're gonna to wanna to pull in uh, this, the async course has been updated uh, across the board with these new RC files to ensure that we are testing fully random timing across all of our exercises. Uh, so you're gonna to want to pull in those new RC files and handle any conflicts that you see. Is there a clean way to not have a four stack of PMOS? controlling LE going up? Or is that something that we should just resize? Uh, let me see. So generally, if you have something like this, where you have four output rails in a way, um, and you need to check those output rails against uh, an input of knowledge, then you would factor these out into their separate validity checks before sticking it into a rule for LE. And so you'd have a rule for W0 or W1 uh, leading to W valid, valid, right? And then mm -hmm. RF or RT leading to R valid. Um, and because these are forward drivers, you can pull uh, well for R, you can pull that validity check from the internal node. But for W, it doesn't, it doesn't have, it's not part of another cycle. It's only part of this one. And so you have to pull it from, from the uh, output node or you'll 
chop the output inverter off out of any cycle that it's part of. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. I'm probably just going to change transistor sizing for now, though, to make sure everything else works. Yeah. For for uh, four stack of PMOS, eh, it's kind of fine. Uh, let's work through this. So we're in our register. The first thing we need to do is put in our PRS body. So PRS G dot PBD, G dot BND. And let's add in the nodes for our uh, internal memory. So pool V0, V1. And we're going to want our internal nodes for our write requests. So underscore W0, underscore W1, and then W0 and W1. Now we can use C1 of two for each of these. Um, that's not, you know, it's it, it's clean. It's nice to work with. Um, it's kind of up to you, personal preference. So the next thing we can do is uh, let's work through our uh, write. Um, so let's. We have L dot B zero. We know that that needs to write to zeros. So that should drive underscore W zero down. And then L dot D one should write a one. So that should drive underscore W one down. We need the output inverters of those two. So not underscore W zero drives W zero up. And same for W one. Then we need to drive our uh, our internal memory. So we have if not v0 or so if if we're not in the v0 state or our we are writing a one so not underscore w1 then we drive v1 pi. Uh, if we are not in the V1 state or we are driving, uh, we are writing a zero, then we drive V0 high. And then we just add in the inverses. So uh, V0 and underscore W1, uh, that drives V1 low and V1 and underscore W0 drives V0 low. Now, your numbering for V0 and V1 may be different from mine because uh, all that changes is whether or not you're using a fully inverted one of two encoding or not. So the one of two encoding, if we have V0 followed by V1, then this is the neutral state, neutral. V0 high, V1 low represents false, V0 low, V1 high represents true. Now your alternative is of course, just to switch these two. So you can you can also have one one be your neutral state, zero one be your false state, and one zero be your true state. It doesn't matter what you use. We are using this one. Okay. Um, I forgot to put in between the write on the internal memory and the uh, rails for W0 and W1 that we lower LE, so W0 or W1, L dot E down. And now we're in the reset phase of our uh, write. So if not L dot D zero and so our goal was to write for L dot D zero was to write a zero. So V zero should be high, which means V one should be low, right? So and not V one, then underscore W zero up, not L dot D one. And so if our goal was to write a one, 
then V1 should be high and V0 should be low, so not V0. Underscore W1 up. Underscore W0, we need our upward inverters, so that drives W0 low. Same for W1. And then we reset LE. So not W0 and not W1, L.E. So that's our right. Now we need a read. So our read is on L.D2. We need to make sure we wait for the output channel to be ready. So that's R.E and. And then we need to check the value of our internal memory. So if our internal memory is zero, then we write r.d0. If our internal memory is one, then we write r.d1. And we need output inverters for that. So not underscore r.d0, r.d0 up. Same for r.d1. And we need to put that into our input acknowledgement. So or r.d0 or r.d1. Then down here, we need the reset rules. So we need to wait for our output enable to reset. We need to wait for our input request on L to reset. And V doesn't change. So we don't need to wait for it. We just call underscore R dot D zero up. And it looks the same for R dot D one. And those drive output inverters. So underscore R dot D zero, R dot D zero down, underscore R dot D one, R dot D one down. And finally, we need to put them in the reset rule for L dot E. So and not R dot D zero and not R dot D one. Now, there is actually a way, aside from factoring this, there is a way to shorten this. I will be covering that method in the optimizations lecture in module uh, four. So there are many optimizations that we can making that we can be making on all of these circuits. Uh, I'll be covering them in detail in that lecture. So we have our register. If I didn't make any mistakes, uh, let's do reset. We want to reset our output rails um, low. So let's do that first. It would be g dot underscore s reset and to block this rule. G dot underscore s reset and to block this rule. And we can do the same thing for our reset phase. So not g dot underscore s reset uh, to force the downgoing rule for r dot d zero and not g dot underscore s reset to force the downgoing rule for r dot d one. Um, now we need to reset our write rails and our internal memory. There are a couple ways to do this. Uh, the first is kind of what you'd initially uh, approach it with, which is just replicating this g dot underscore s reset and on the right rails, g dot underscore s reset and. So this is probably what you have, not g dot underscore s reset or, and not g dot underscore s reset or. Then you'd want to reset v0 high to represent initializing the internal memory with zero. So that would be not g dot underscore s reset to drive that rule up. And then g dot underscore s reset uh, and to prevent this rule from firing. Um, so we can add redundancy and add another rule here not g dot s reset and that. Um, that is, 
that may or may not be needed depending upon the handshake. We can check um, the digital simulation for this later. So G dot S reset four for the down one rule. So this is the first approach for reset. The second approach for reset is to reset W zero um, high and L dot E low. Now that puts an assumption on your input channel. Your input channel cannot have an initial token. But what that does is it allows you to remove all of the reset rules on your internal memory. Does that make sense? So if I were to do that, it would look like this. G dot S reset or that resets W zero or underscore W zero low, which resets W zero high. That also forces L dot E low. Then this would be not G dot S reset and so that prevents this rule from firing. And it propagates through the rest of the handshake. Now, because double underscore W1 is reset high, this is enabled. Uh, and because underscore W uh, W0 is reset low, this is disabled. Now, this is disabled and this is enabled, which means that V0 will be driven high by this and V1 will may fight for a minute, right? Because we don't know the initial value of V0 it has to take some time to transition. And so we can maybe remove some of these. Let's see. I may get some internal, some in instability on our reset phase, on our, on reset. Let's see what happens. Okay, uh, let's open up the tool set. <clears throat> make E1, uh, identifier underscore R is not defined, I'll do that, C1 of 2, underscore R, make E1, okay, Pearson E1 dot PRS, source E1 dot RC. And there's no instability on reset. And so we can cycle this for forever and it's fine. Now notice that we told the simulator about the channels. So it can now tell you, all right, uh, the input request on D uh, or on L is valid and it has this value one, or it's in a neutral state or it has two, right? I can talk, tell you about R.D um, being in a valid state or a neutral state. You'll also notice that over here, we have information about those uh, one of N encodings and which rail is set, right? Is it D0, D1, D2? Uh, and that's happening as the that rail switches. So if you look here, you'll see the uh, request rail switches to zero. We get information now about the, the encoding as a whole. Okay. So that is 
<clears throat> reset. And, you know, there are more or less conservative ways to reset this uh, input, this internal latch. Um, and I'm showing you uh, probably the least conservative way. It makes assumptions about the input channel. Uh, it forces us to wait a little bit longer and reset. Uh, and there may be a little bit of fighting in that latch uh, in the beginning. So let us run the analog simulation. So go into E1, Kirsten, env.prs, source, Kirsten.rc. And so it opens up the netlist and runs the analog simulation. I'm going to go ahead and tell it to stop. There are a few test that spy out PRN. And we've got our input requests on L, D0, D1, D2. Let's zoom in a bit. Go all the way back to reset. All right, our input enable, LE. Our output requests on R, the read channel, R0, R1. And our output enable on R. And then we can look at the values of V0 and V1. So V0 is here, V1 is here. And you'll notice that they always switch off from each other. Right? First, the one of the rails goes high and then the other rail goes low. And it's always that order. High, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. It just keeps going like that. And so if we look at our inputs here, we have a request on uh, L. Uh, to write, or actually to read the value. So that's the first request. So it reads out r.d0. Then we have a request to write a zero. And you don't get any output from the uh, read channel. And also v doesn't switch because it's already a zero. Then you get a request to read the value again. We get a zero on the output. And then finally, we get a request to write a one. And that's when B switches. It switches to one, and we acknowledge the input. Then we get a request to read, and we read a one. And so you can see it's working properly. Um, there is an extra feature in the uh, waveform viewer for the digital simulation. So if you run prsim uh, e1.prs pipe t e1.sim source e1.rc and you run it, we can cycle. Then we run sim to vcd e1.sim to e1.vcd. And we, G, we open up GTK wave, v1.vcd. Now, because we have told our simulator about the encodings, it adds information about those encodings, consolidated information in these special nodes. So if we zoom out a bit, this encoding switches between the neutral state designated in red, the zero value, and the one value. Uh, it only really works for one of two. One of three gets a little weird. It doesn't really know much about that. So if you are working with a bunch of one and two encoded rails, it's interesting to use to look at, but if you're looking at a one of three, it's not particularly helpful. 
it's basically just checking is it is is it uh false neutral or not false 